This is September 26, 1984. Bernice Jackson interviewing Robert Howard of Laverne, Oklahoma, formerly of for, uh, Logan, Oklahoma. Okay, Robert, tell me about your grandfather, who seemed to be the first <coughs> ones to come. Uh, my grandfather name was Dave Howard. He uh, first came to Enid, Oklahoma. He ran the race, a ter a race on the opening of the territory strip that they run the race on, and he uh, uh, homesteaded on a place down by Gultry, Oklahoma, near Enid, and that's where that uh, my father was raised as a child for some years. I'm not sure just how long they lived there, but they Excuse lived Excuse me, do you remember your grandfather telling you any stories about the race, his coming? I remember my father telling about him, but okay. I do not remember my, but I do remember my father telling me that they started the race and it was a just a little small pony he was riding this. He was not pulling it. He was riding it. And that, uh, anyhow, they were all making kind of light of him because of the, such a little light pony. But he said that, anyhow, he told me the horse's name and, and told me a few things like that. And that's about all that I can really remember. It's been so long since I sat down and talked to my father about that. Mm -hmm. But, anyhow, I do remember him saying that he t described the pony to me and the size, and it was a small one. And uh, but he won the race. Did he get a good piece of land? Very good. He got a very good piece of land. Uh, I have been back and I have seen it several times since. And uh, some of the the folks uh, owned it up until just recently, and I ain't right sure that some of them still uh, don't own it. They named uh, the one that uh, the cousin that owned it last. His name was O. B. Howard, which my father named my youngest brother after him, Orville Howard. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were on the place when I went down and talked with him, saw him. They were still on the place at that mm -hmm. time. Okay, and then he decided to come out to Beaver County. He came to Beaver County and settled on a claim down by, on the Kiowa Creek. It was approximately four and a half miles south of Midway Church, uh, known as the Herb Smith land. Herb Smith uh, purchased it. I think some of their family purchased this from my grandfather. And uh, then it's known now that it's, it's a state of Herb, which his daughter owns it, Freddie Jurgerson and her, and uh, Bougie, it used to be mm -hmm. Bougie Smith. They own the place now. But your father was raised over at Gold Tree. He spent um, a part of his life there. Uh -huh. They originally, I believe my father has told me, they originally came from Kansas. His people originated out of Kansas uh -huh. at uh, early years. Of course, uh -huh. he never did live in Kansas, but that was where his people, the Howard at that time, originated out uh -huh. of Kansas. Uh -huh. And then he, my father, then he filed a, at uh, up just about a mile north of his father's homestead mm -hmm. there on this place where he, it's still known as the, the, my brother still owns the place there. We, when my mother and father passed away, why, uh, two of us boys still has the land there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and your mother was, what was her name? Her name was Hattie Howard. Mm -hmm. And my father's name was Christopher Washington Howard. That was mm -hmm. My mother's name, full name, was Hattie May Howard. She always signed it Hattie M. And my father always signed his as Chris W. Howard. Mm -hmm. He never did write the full name. He couldn't fi figure why anyone would pile such a big name on anybody, but <laughs> that's a quite a name to Christopher Washington Howard, right? So he always, always signed it C.W. or Chris W. You know? mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, how many children was in your family? 
There were seven children. There were five boys and two girls. Uh, Irvin, he was the oldest. And then Glenn, and then Fred, and then Mary, my sister, my oldest sister, she came along then. And then my other sister, I had two sisters, which was Marjorie, and then myself, which is Robert, and then my youngest brother, Orville. And they were, that was our entire family. That was family. your family. Our family all was, we didn't, we never lost a child, and my parents raised all their family there without a loss of any, death of any kind until um, uh, Fred, he was killed in an accident in 48, I believe it was. I wouldn't be sure on that. That dates, I'm not good at dates. I don't remember. But uh, anyhow, we, he raised the entire family there. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's see. You were going to tell me about the uh, Logan, the very original site of Logan. And do you remember where it got its name, Logan? I have heard two stories of this. I heard this one time that that said that General Logan, there was a general by the name of Logan, that they named it after him. But they, I think it Miss Harlan told me that was a lady that uh, was old timer. She would probably be uh, 120 years old if she was living today. Anyhow, she told me that there was a family or a, there that was named Logan that this town of Logan was named after. Mm-hmm. It was named after a man that lived there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know there is a grave in the old Kiowa Cemetery that we made the stones for and put a name, his name is Logan. Now, whether he is the man or not, we do not know, but there is one stone down there, that homemade stone, because I helped make it, and it's got the name, man's name of Logan on it, because it's on the plot. I know that. And you remember the date? There was no date on it. No oh. one had the date, and there uh-huh. is no date on it. It just was on the plot was Logan, uh, and that is always on the stone. Mm-hmm. And there was no stone there at all, but we made up some, so we'd have some markers, and uh, this has Logan on it. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the first schoolhouse and the first post office was located where from the Midway Church, present day Midway Church? Uh, the uh, original post office, Logan Post Office, was. Um, three miles south of the Midway Church and about a half a mile east, I mean a mile and a half east in a, in my pasture that I own now, but, but no one, uh, been very few that recognized it because it's been so long since it was there, but the ruins are still there. The post office was there also a little school that they started in 18 and 89 is when it was just a few people went there. Uh, my uncle Murray Baker gave me that information there that he went to school there his first year in 18 and 89 and uh, it burnt down. It was a sod but it burnt down. That sounds kind of far-fetched but he, I, he went ahead and asked him, I said, how did it burn down the sod? He said, well, the seats in the top was all a, a brush and wood, and I, if I remember right, I, it was through a coal stove or wood stove that it caught fire and what burned it down. And then they moved to the rock schoolhouse, which mm-hmm. is down there. Now. And the post office, uh, where it was, it was located in that area too. Yes, it was in just within a few feet from that. Was it a sod house too? Yes, the mm-hmm. it was a. Are there any remnants of those two? Houses? Yes, the, there are still mounds of dirt, there's still metal laying around there, and different things that shows you that there were buildings there. Well. Miss Althea Gilbert ran that post office at that time. She was the lady which was Mrs. E.E. E. Harlan's mother. She ran the first post office that was ever put at Logan. Mm-hmm. And then she moved it up there to 
where the old ruins are now. Okay. And uh, then in the meantime, they had to build this rock house. Tell me about it. Where did they get the rock and, and who all helped? <coughs> and At the time, <coughs> I do not remember. That is, I was not old enough to know who built this rock school house because I was too young at that time. I wasn't even born. But uh, I do know that my father told me that he helped build it. And um, he told me of a lot of others that helped on it. In fact, I, so it was probably a neighborhood project. But I would say that Elmer Harlan and probably Lon McClurg and Pims, any of the men around there that their kids were going to school, I'm sure they all helped build the schoolhouse. It was all quarried out of the old Pim Hill, which is known as the Pim Hill, which is a mile east of the Logan School right now. Mm -hmm. And it still stands, the walls are still That would be a job, getting that rock. How did they manage to get the rock? They just would break it out. Uh, um, I don't know whether they used dynamite, but I don't think they did. I think they just broke the big rock out and then they would shape it and saw the outside rocks is all that were shaped. The rest of them, the fillers and so forth, was it was put up with, a lot of it was put up with mud. It wasn't put up with mortar like we put up today. Mm -hmm. It was just packed in there with mud because uh, it still shows. But the outside, uh, they would take those and they would saw them and shape them where they'd be smooth on the outside. Mm -hmm. And then they would lay the outside up like they do brick, and then they'd fill in with just any kind of rock in the side. Mm -hmm. But they were just, uh, and they could have uh, used a saw some kind to saw some of them out when they took them out. They might have sawed them then. Mm -hmm. But I have watched them take out some rock up there, and it's a soft rock. It isn't a real hard rock. It's a chalk rock. It, it, and then it hardens. No, it never does. It still stays the same. It, uh, doesn't, oh, it harden. doesn't harden when no. it hits there? No, no. It's still just a chalk rock. It isn't any good, really, for concrete. It, it'll break, you know, if you put it in concrete, which we used to use a lot in concrete because we thought that was a filler and save concrete. But mm -hmm. really, it doesn't strengthen your concrete any because it's a chalky rock. And well. It'll break. You get it wet, mm -hmm. well, it'll chalk up pretty bad. Okay, who started the first store, uh, mercantile general store, they call them? Uh, to my knowledge, and I remember this one, but I'm sure now that there was possibly uh, one before this. Uh, I have this picture here. The first store was Mrs. Gilbert was the first. Mm -hmm. She was the first one to have a store in hardware at Logan. The first one that I remember was T.T. T. Yarnell. They had a mercantile store there, but I have this picture here that shows her in, the, in it that uh, was uh, Mrs. Gilbert. It was her. It was the, her hardware store. What all would they have in a hardware store? Can you describe one for me? All right. In uh, this store here, they had horseshoes, which they didn't have to play horseshoes with, and they used them to shoe horses at that yes, time. Yes, it was important. It was have. very important. And uh, then they had horse collars, and they had horse pads. They had uh, water buckets. They had coal hods. And uh, just anything that would pertain to necessities. There was no, you didn't uh, see too many luxuries laying around. It was all something that they really had to use, you know. And did they have dry goods? Uh, not in this hardware. Now they had, I think they had some dry goods. I'm sure they did. I think they had just a general, well, I know they did. They had a general store there. After this, I think the hardware came here first, and then I think the general store was put in the front of it. I think this was in the back, because um, the, I know they had, uh, in my recollection, they had materials, they had threads, they had, you could buy about anything there that you could buy at a variety store today, as far as making a dress or making a shirt or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, you'll find tubs, you'll find boilers. We would uh, really, really like to find some of those things nowadays. And, uh, 
and some of we'd buy them up for collector's items if we could find them now. And here's a that looks like a coal burning stove. Yes, or that's, wood. A, that's a that's an old pot bellied uh, wood stove and coal stove, which was probably more wood than coal. Since there weren't any trees on the Kiowa at that time, where did they get their wood? Well, you ask me a question there. I suppose there was wood somewhere, weren't there? Maybe there weren't at that early, early days. They possibly wouldn't, because they had to go quite a ways to even get their lumber. Yes. But uh, I suppose I figured there would probably be trees somewhere. Well, I was surprised to see this picture that where Kiowa Creek didn't have any trees. It was just a small stream out in the prairie. Of course, if I remember and hear my father talk. Back um, years ago, they used to burn cow chips. Of course, that was mm -hmm. there wouldn't be a whole lot of cow chips at that time in those early years. But they would burn uh, broom. We used to burn broom corn seed. I know they used to tell me about burning broom corn seed and cow chips. But uh, I never. I just supposed there was always trees and. and mm -hmm. as well as I did burn. too. Uh, but I, I couldn't answer that, and of course there would not be no coal. I don't know just what, uh, of course, in those sod houses, they were not like our open houses today. No. They were they were warm. They were warm. Mm -hmm. And when you went to bed at night, you didn't turn the fire down and turn it up. You put on a big old heavy comfort, uh, mm -hmm. big enough to weight you down, and that's mm -hmm. what you kept warm by. All right, <clears throat> you were telling me about a tornado, or a cyclone rather, that hit. Uh, Logan and blew it away. Um, you mentioned something about somebody that had uh, that was grading the road with four horses. Who was that man? Okay, that was uh, Mr. Bell. They called him Tubby Bell. That was his nickname. I don't remember his real name, but I always knew him as Tubby, and everybody called him Tubby. And uh, he and Ben Morse was caught there. Mr. Bell was a grading the roads at that time. They had a little grader, four-wheel grader, and four-headed horses. And he, I can remember my time of seeing him grade the roads. The horses would just be a jogging along at a very slow pace up the road they'd go, and uh, making roads for the Model T's and Model A's at that time. And uh, he came by, the storm was coming up, and coming out of the southwest, northwest, it's coming out of the northwest. And uh, so he tied his horses up out there at the road and walked over to the store. And Ben Morse was there. He was a bachelor, he never was married, but he always was around Logan. Everybody knew Ben Morse. He was a mail carrier's brother there, Pete Morris, used to be a mail carrier. Anyhow, they were saw this storm coming up. And ben says to Tubby, he said, you better get a hold of them gas pumps. This wind's about to blow us away. So I said, we uh, got over and hung on to these gas pumps and laid down on our stomach, he said, and hung on to the gas pump. And he said, uh, Mr. Bell was telling this story. Mm -hmm. He said, and pretty soon, he said, we looked across the post office on the west side of the road and the store was on the east side. And he looked over and he looked, Ben said to Tubby, he said, Tubby, you better look out because here comes the post office. <laughs> and it was all in the same direction. The post office was kind of northwest of them and they didn't miss them very far. But anyhow, it just come rolling. It didn't pick it up and built like a twister did. It just mm -hmm. blew it, just a strong wind. Of course, it was just a little old uh, wood frame building, one room. You know, it ain't like our buildings today. But anyhow, he had come across the the road, and anyhow, I missed him, and it took the store and everything. Everything blew away. There was a, a uh, cream station in a poultry house there, and um, Mr. Weiser, uh, He's the one that run that, and that uh, Mr. Mansfield run the post office. There was several buildings there at the time. It, well, Logan was, I'm not sure, but I think someone said at one time they were somewhere around 
uh, 15, 16 people lived in Logan at one time. Anyhow, they blew all scattered the people around, all the debris around. It, when the Kiowa came up, I remember the Kiowa got real big, and uh, I could see the bolt of goods, like he was talking about the material. I can remember seeing big bolts of goods floating down the, the river, and it got banked full. And, of course, we everybody was pretty hard up at that time. We thought, what a waste it was. We could see the food floating down the river, and it was a kind of a pitiful sight. We got there. We got there with, I'd say, within uh, 30 minutes after the storm, uh, mm -hmm. we'd heard about it. Of course, then uh, you give a general ring, and everybody got on the phone. See, yes. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, we heard about it pretty quick, and we found uh, Mrs. Yarnell under a side of the building down there with a nail in her leg. She couldn't pull out because the nail had went through her leg. And so we lifted that off of her. And uh, uh, Edwin Yarnell, he was in the hen house and he was sitting in there scared to death. And he said a two before, there's a little chicken house out there that they kept chickens in. He said a two before came through the wall and just missed him, just the front of him. Just uh, like a little bit of getting him there. And then the boy it threw him over under another part of a building. Anyhow, they were just scattered around everywhere. And so this, uh, they moved the store down to about a quarter of a mile south of this site um, called the old Woodman Lodge is what it was at the time. <coughs> and uh, that's where they had a lodge. And uh, they had set up a temporary grocery store there for a while in Cream Station until they could get built back. They were going to build back, and and they had jugs of water there to drink out of because there's no well down there. In uh, of course, where they'd moved the cream station to, they'd taken jugs of acid down there. And this Mr. Weiser, he didn't know that the, he thought they were all water, and he drank this acid out of this jug, and he. He taken his life right quick, you know. He mm -hmm. didn't last no time till any month. Well, was he <coughs> the one that that floated through the air? No, that was the the postmaster. Oh, that was Mr. Mansfield. He said that he when he left the post office, it blew it away, and he picked him up, and he was just kind of floating up around his back, and he could look over, and he'd see the debris flying around, and seeing the everything was blowing away, and he felt like it that saved him from all that blowing on him because he was up above it. Most of it was down below him, but then mm -hmm. he came down and he was injured and he was laid up for a while, but nothing serious. That would be an awesome <coughs> sight. Yes. <laughs> he said it was a terrible sight. He said there's a big wind, of course, terrible wind with it. Mm -hmm. And he said just picking him up, he was said he, he said about best he could tell, he was eight or ten feet off the ground is about where mm -hmm. he was blowing, as best mm -hmm. he could tell. But it blew him, uh, I would say, four or five hundred feet from the post office. That's where I've, we found him. I've read accounts of that, and they call it a tornado. But you say it's a cyclone. What's the difference in that? Well, they tell me that a cyclone is a straight blowing wind, and a tornado is a circular type wind twisting. Mm -hmm. Now, this didn't twist at all. This just everything was laid one way, and it didn't twist nothing. It was blowed over, blowed down, tree, there was nothing, the trees was blowed over, blowed straight, everything laid the same direction, nothing twisted. Now you folks just <coughs> lived, uh, what, a mile west of there and south? We lived a, half, a mile west and a mile south. How was the storm at your house? Strong wind, but, uh, and we could tell that there was a storm uh, going through somewhere, but we couldn't tell just where, because we mm -hmm. could tell by the the sound, the noise that it was, it, it was missing us, but we didn't know at the time just where it was at, but mm -hmm. we we felt like there was a storm somewhere, because mm -hmm. we could tell. But there was a very strong wind where we were at. Mm -hmm. All right, let's backtrack now and go back to your childhood. What was your, uh, all of your children had tasks to perform, I'm sure, and <coughs> what was yours? Well, we all worked together, of course. We all had different jobs at different times. In school years, when we went to school, I, of course, uh, we'd go to school during the day. In the evenings, we'd come home. As we had hogs to feed. We had uh, 
cows to milk, and we would, uh, of course, come to the pasture on the way home. Usually, when our cattle was over a ways from the house, we had a pasture leased about a mile and a half from the house, and we would come through there and drive the cows in when we would come in from school. And then every morning when we'd go to school, we'd take them, we'd have to drive them up a road a ways to get to the pasture, because our house that I where we lived was about a half mile from the pasture, then the pasture was a mile long, so... So we have to drive them up the road until we get to the pasture, and we drive them to the pasture when we go to school and drive in when we come home from school, which made it handy. And we were barefooted part of the time, but we didn't mind that because uh, we like to go barefooted, and of course our shoes sometimes was tennis shoes, so it didn't make a whole lot of difference when you hit a cactus right when I went through the tennis shoes about as quick as it did anyhow. But anyhow, that was part of our job, and then we had to gather the wood in the winter time for our coal stove. We always had a coal stove and uh, we'd feel like it was a really a treat if we'd, Dad go to town and bring back a sack of coal because that would be a, quite a treat to us and set in around a... Give you a rest for yeah. bringing in the wood. And we could bed it down and it'd still be a pretty good chunk of coal in there uh, most of the evening, you know. And then, of course, uh, lots of times when we get in the evenings, if it was in the summertime, we were pulling broom corn or something like us kids would still, we'd get in and we'd help pull broom corn for an hour or so before we'd go milk, you know. And then mm-hmm. we'd milk the cows and feed the hogs. We always had a bunch of hogs to feed and, and the chicken to shut up. Of course, we could never shut the chickens up until after they go to roost. And that was always a scary job because sometimes it'd be dark when we'd go up and, mm-hmm. and we could always walk up real brave. But when we'd come back, we just knew that something was behind us, you know. Of course, our barn was quite away from the house and so was our chicken house where nothing of our place was very close. I suppose our barn was about a half a quarter from our house and we would uh, carry our milk a lot of times from the house back up there to feed the kids. Or, mm-hmm. So we had a quite a walk with carrying the milk but anyhow that's uh, the way that mm-hmm. he built it up by the old sod house when he had the sod house and then when he built the new house why Years later, why well, he moved it away, and therefore that made the corral and the barn quite away from the house. Mm-hmm. But he originally uh, lived in the side house. Uh, how many rooms in the side house? Just two rooms. Mm-hmm. It was just two rooms. Two uh, big rooms. Two big rooms. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. They were, then he, of course, built onto the built a two-room house originally when he built a new house. But then in a few years, why well, he've added on three more rooms. And mm-hmm. But uh, originally, his original house that he made of wood was only a two-room house. Can you tell me what you did for recreation? <clears throat> we called in the neighbors. And we didn't, by that, what I say, call in, everybody knew that uh, all we had to do was start walking down the road and let's go someplace and have a party tonight or we had all... Uh, uh, going to go down someplace and eat, or going to go eat watermelon, or something like that. You know, it wasn't going to town because it was just that was not there was nothing to that because uh, we didn't. If we ever went to town and got a nickel worth of candy, that's just like going to the uh, Oklahoma State Fair nowadays. Yes, yeah, more so. Mm-hmm. But uh, we uh, would gather on Sundays. My mother was a great cook and. My father provided a lot of food for and they enjoyed a lot of company and uh, so there'd be a bunch of kids come home with us on Sunday and and we'd have water fights and we'd have races and we had an old two-wheel cart that some of us would uh, get in that and others would push it and I don't know why that was fun but it sounds kind of far-fetched now but in those days that was fun mm-hmm. and uh, we'd, uh, I remember we used to take a lath and make a tea out of it. The lath would be about three feet long, and we'd nail a piece across the bottom, and we'd take these old hoops off of wagon wheels, and, mm-hmm. and we'd use them and roll them. Take that stick, and we'd roll them. We'd roll them for miles. That was our. That was just like a bicycle nowadays. Mm-hmm. You couldn't ride it or nothing. There was no riding no. to it, but it was just a plaything. Mm-hmm. And I can remember we used to roll them for miles and miles. That was one of our play toys. You lived there close to the creek. Did you do any hunting and fishing? Yes, we did. We did a lot of fishing and hunting. Uh, my father was quite a hunter, and he liked to fish too, but he loved to hunt, and uh, we would take off, and down the creek we'd go, or up 
we had prairie chicken. We had, at that time, we had uh, uh, duck, and once in a while there'd be a bunch of geese laying out in the pasture field. But uh, rabbit and those things like that, we saved everything that we could. Uh, oh, we didn't eat old jack or anything like that, but we could. Uh, in wintertime, there was cottontails, what we mostly mm -hmm. ate, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, my father, he would, uh, he was quite a, taking quite a pride in, in all those things. He would take them and clean them and put them out on a clothesline and freeze them at night or put them up where they freeze. And then he had a special way that he had mother to cook them, and they were delicious. They were good. Now, we, there was no wild taste to them the way they had them fixed because we didn't have deep freezes, nothing like that, you no. know. But not in those days. Not in those days. It was a, it was a kind of living on the father land, the way I always called it. And mm -hmm. summertime we'd go fishing. My father, he would uh, say, "Well, the farming is pretty well caught up, and the horses are rested a little bit. Uh, we'll get in the wagon. We'll ride down to the creek. It was a creek there, all oh, about two mile and a half where we got to fish. Now the creek was closer than that, but where we went fishing was a special place." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would go down there, and we would always catch us a mess of fish, and that would be a big treat to us. We'd get to eat fish for it. Did you have a swimming hole? Yes. Over on uh, the Kai Wall was a swimming hole, and on the place where we drove these cattle in, there was a spring-fed place there that uh, we always went swimming. That was and that water wasn't cold? That water was cold, but it, we <laughs> never did mind it. We didn't make any difference. And of course, we had a big stock tank at our place. It was about uh, 20 foot square, I'd say. And of course, that was my, our Saturday night bathtub. <laughs> when, the, when the windmill ran and had good, clean, cool water, you know. Yes. And we, of course, would irrigate a big garden, and we would keep that tank cleaned out. We mm -hmm. would clean the tank out and keep it clean. Okay, and you, uh, where did you meet your wife at? Uh, I met my wife at a dance out at Booker, Texas. She was, uh, they used to call it the Bohunk Dances, is what they call their Bohemian people out there. And uh, I met my wife at a dance there one night, and I, uh, that's the first time I had ever seen her. I didn't get have a date with her that night, but that was the first time I met her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bet you had a date soon after that. Right. <laughs> she wouldn't go with me for quite a while, because those days you just didn't find someone that would pick up and go with you any time. You could, they've kind of had to find out who you were, and kind of whether you, what kind of character you were, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And now I, I ain't gonna say that they're any, any better now. I'm not trying to make comparison, but uh, I went with her about uh, two years, I'd say, mm -hmm. before we were married. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, did she, what did she do? Just a housewife, or was she a school teacher, or what? To you mean after we were married yes, or before? Yes, afterwards. Uh, yeah, well, she was just a housewife. We just uh, got married, and uh, we rented a little house over west of us there where my folks lived, and we milked some cows, and, and I, I never will forget that I went to Derrissette and borrowed $80 to buy an old sow and eight pigs. That was the first money I ever borrowed. And I borrowed it from, home, borrowed it from Homer Montgomery. He was a banker at Derrissette. And I, we brought him home. We were really proud of that. And they all died but one pig. Oh, my. <laughs> so we had one sow and one pig. So we started out. And I told several of them since, I said, I'm still paying on that $80. <laughs> 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 and uh, that's, um, that was the first money I ever bought. That was the first livestock I ever bought. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was, uh, we, we didn't mind it. We enjoyed it. We, we always had enough cream and eggs that we, by being real careful, we could uh, go to town and buy our groceries mm -hmm. and come back. And 
we had our fun. I don't know why, but we enjoyed it just as well as we do now. Mm -hmm. It was different, but we enjoyed it. Do you remember um, when, the, let's see, what year were you born? I was born in 21. 21. Do you remember the Depression? Yes. I was going to tell you about my father on that. When my chore, one of my chores was having the feed put in the barn for my dad's horses when they come in at night, and I was to harness his horses every morning and have them ready for him to go to the field. That was my chore. As many a time at 4 o'clock in the morning, I would go out in the pasture to run the horses in. It'd be so dark. We had soap weeds out of there. I'd be so dark, I'd try to go and dry them soap weeds in for cows or horses because I was so dark I couldn't see. But we had a dog that I could send the dog after him, and he would find the horses for me. Mm -hmm. And But I remember my father getting on this one little lister, and I'd go out the field to see what time he's going to quit so that when they had the feed in for the horses, and I could hardly see him. I'd be, oh, maybe uh, 60, 70 feet from him sometimes, and I could just barely see them. The dirt was really blowing. I could just barely see him coming out the end of the field, listing the field in, that one row at a time. About 1932? Uh, yes, I'd say 32. Mm -hmm. uh, 32, 30, somewhere along in there. I don't really remember the year, but I know that, and we had several horses to die with dust pneumonia. Uh, some of our best horses we had to, would get dust pneumonia and mm -hmm. die. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember um, any particular dirt storm? I remember the dark one. I know that. That was my the one that I'll never forget. I Tell was me in, about it. <clears throat> that was another time when everybody gathered at mothers and dads on Sunday. Mm -hmm. We had a whole bunch of people at our house on Sunday. And I don't know who all they were. I know it was my cousins were there. And anyhow, we were going, my, me and two of my cousins were going to walk after cows, which was over there in this same pasture. So we were going to walk up the road till we get even with the cows, and we'd cut across the pasture and bring them in. So we were walking, we were about a half a mile north of the house. And we saw little streaks of shooting up in the air, but never thought nothing about them. And it come up so quick with them, in a matter of 30 minutes, the storm was on us, you know. And so when we saw it coming, we started to run for the another house just north. Of, we were closer to a, a, just a half a mile between the two houses. Mm -hmm. and, but we were closer to the other house. And there was an old building there that had a basement under it. He had the old building about ready to fall down. It's more dangerous to be under the building than it was to face the storm. But we didn't know it. We thought if we'd get to that old basement, we'd get in it. Mm -hmm. And on the way running, here come my sister and two girls. They'd been up the road of walking. That was a beautiful afternoon. Mm -hmm. And they had been up the road of walking, and they were coming to meet us. And, mm -hmm. of course, when they saw it, they started running for our home, which was the other direction, you know. Mm -hmm. So they went running for the our home, the house, and we went to run into this other house. So we were running in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. Well, we made it to this little building, and we just opened the door and just kind of fell in. But that time it was so dark that we couldn't see anything after we got down there. We just stayed under there until, uh, well, I don't know, just a short time. And how we started to peek out, and we still couldn't see anything. Could you see each other? No, no, we couldn't see each other. It was course it was rather dark in this old dirt there's a dirt basement you know it's oh, all dirt mm -hmm. and but um, we still couldn't see each other and uh, of course with the storm on it we couldn't see him but anyhow finally when it finally cleared away we crawled out then and in a matter of minutes or not too long someone came up the road and we caught a ride and went on back to the house but uh, some my father and uh, some other people that was at our place, started up the road to get us, and I met these girls just as the storm hit. Well, of course, they got the girls and got a hold of them, and, uh, but they didn't know where we were at. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, we had to wait till the storm was over, and when they found us, we was walking back down the road. And I don't know whether we ever got the cows in that night or not. <laughs> they might have not got milked. <laughs> I don't know, but it was a terrible feeling then. Everybody was just kind of walking around in a daze, and mm -hmm. we still had a lot of people there, and they didn't go home. They stayed there with us. I think most of them 
stayed there through the night. It mm -hmm. just uh, it was still awfully dirty, and everybody was just kind of scared, you know, didn't know exactly what was going on. Can you uh, tell me how you managed in the dirt storm without raising any crops? I was not old enough to really know the feel of it. Uh, I know, naturally, I'd always gripe at Dad if I couldn't have a candy bar, or if I couldn't have some candy or something like that. But I can remember my dad uh, uh, saying something about it. Well, he said, I just don't have it. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, uh, there's just nothing. The I, only thing I can tell you, I don't have it. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, we would just have to figure the rest of it out. I, and I, but I don't, I was old enough just kind of on the tail end of the um, Depression years. And mm -hmm. uh, just in a few years, things went to kind of shaping up. Yeah. I can remember probably one year of it that, that would uh, mm -hmm. be the Depression. <clears throat> um, what did your father do then? Uh, now, my, uh, we were living, you see, almost straight east of where the yes. folks were. And one day the wind would blow from the south, next day it'd come back. And uh, we didn't raise anything for two or three years. We didn't either. My dad did carpenter work. Did he ever work on that WPA? I uh, don't think my father ever did. He uh, done mostly carbon work. He and Earl Hood used to work as carbon work. I know he worked on the Federalist House, a ranch south of Dares Ed. He'd be gone all week. He wouldn't come back in only on weekends. Mm -hmm. And I know several times that I hear him tell my mother that he said, well, he said, We've got enough that we can buy groceries and buy the kids some clothes. I remember just talking about it, you know, mm -hmm. just the particulars. I don't remember, but I can remember that he felt pretty good that they had made an effort. They could uh, buy that. And in the wintertime, uh, we'd hunt skunks, and that would be our money. And I could pick up bones. I'd go all over the country with dead horses and dead cattle that died, I'd pick the bones up and we'd take them and sell them and that would be my Saturday night money. Do you money. remember how much you got <clears throat> for the bones? Uh, the, I don't remember how many I had. About the most I ever got was about $3 out of the home. Whatever I had would mm -hmm. be a load, I suppose, a part of a wagon load or something but like that. That was a lot of money. Oh my, yeah, that was a lot of money. I'd share that with all my brothers and sisters. And <laughs> we all had money there. Yes. <clears throat> but uh, that, then uh, we'd have trapped and we had what we called a skunk house. And uh, it was a little building up there, and it was a, it had a big pen out there. And all during the summer, we would catch these skunks alive and put them in this pen. And then we would uh, wait till it got cold, till our hides began to temper, see the hides mm -hmm. hash the season, and get tempered to the cold weather mm -hmm. before they're any good. So then in the middle of the winter, why my dad would say, well, I guess this is, a, this is the day we kill the skunks. Mm -hmm. So he would go up and uh, he would kill the skunks and the rest of us would skin and that would be a big day for us. Mm -hmm. We'd have as high as, oh, sometimes 75, 80 skunks pinned up. And what did you get for them? Oh, uh, I can't remember for sure, but it seemed like at that time a real good skunk hide would probably bring us a dollar and a quarter dollar and a half then they got higher than that but right then i think about a dollar and a quarter a dollar and a half was a mm -hmm. in about uh, 25 35 cents for a possum hide and mm -hmm. and a badger of course you get five six dollars for a badger hide and coyote was about a dollar and a half something like that but the badger was worth more a than silver but what they call a silver badger was worth more than it right mm -hmm. at that time we get more out of silver badger than we could anything well now what's the difference in the well it's just uh, the difference in their fur there's different looking there's different badgers what they call a silver badger and then and uh, mm -hmm. i can see them today and when i look at them i can tell there's difference in the badger mm -hmm. hides but mm -hmm. there was something about the fur man that bought them he liked he wanted the silver badger did you folks have the flu when uh, it was going around not to my knowledge. I don't remember of it. No, you'd be before. I don't remember of it. But uh, 
I just wondered if you remember your folks talking about it. Uh, yes, I remember them talking about it, yes. But I don't remember. I remember every once in a while my mother and father would say, uh, they died, this one passed away at the year the flu was so bad and so mm -hmm. forth like that. And, but I don't uh, remember this mm -hmm. one that was that bad. Uh, <laughs> the Second World War, what can you tell me of your remembrance of it? Uh, I was not in the Second World War. I don't remember really any particular other than I do know that uh, uh, we everybody was concerned about being conservative, about uh, not spending uh, gas and different things that was mm -hmm. carrying on with the war. I know we at home we would conserve and we would save and and. Uh, was that the time we had the. Uh, Sugared the rationing of rationing. all that, yes. We had a big family, and uh, uh, but we could, uh, we had you no know, enough stamps and things, whatever, taken that time mm -hmm. that uh, we got by with it all right. But of course, it was not like we'd like to have, and all yes. that. but nobody else had it either, and everybody mm -hmm. else was trying to save too. And then we had another. Uh, a drought in the 50s, did we not? It wasn't like the ones in the 30s. 51 or 52, I believe it was. I can't remember just when that was. <clears throat> I uh, can't remember a lot about it. It seemed like we, it was nothing like the other one because we, people had probably got enough ahead that they could have, survive a little better with it, mm -hmm. you know. It was a, it maybe maybe it was a false economy, but anyhow, it was enough that you could buy a little money to live on, and you mm -hmm. could uh, you had enough kind of saved up that you could kind of scrape around and get by a little better. It was a different than the first one. Um, when uh, let's go back to Logan, what caused it to uh, be uh, abandoned? Uh, they annexed. The Logan School, about that time, and some of the other schools, they were getting so few kids. The uh, last year I went to school there, there were five that was going to school. And then it went on about a year or two later, and finally it wound up with just two people going to school there. So then they annexed into the Overstreet School. I think uh, Logan went into the, I know it did, it went into the Overstreet School. And of course, a lot of the other little schools annexed into other schools. Yeah. But it was uh, the lack of children. Of course, people mm -hmm. had moved away and some had uh, uh, left, you know. Were there quite a few people gone, that is, did the dirt storm days? Oh, dirt yes, storm bowl yes. caused there people was, to move out. There was a lots of people moved out. I, I can't remember the way I remembered when as I got older, they would tell me that uh, they left in the dirty thirties is what they'd mm -hmm. say. And they'd say, Well, they lost all they had in the dirty thirties or they couldn't stand it any longer and they left, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, that's what really thinned them out was uh, the doing dirty thirties. <clears throat> when I even when I was a small child, a lot of people had really had left. Uh, it wasn't as many there when my father was, usually he could tell me that at night they would sat out on their porch and they would sing and play music and they could, uh, neighbors could hear them and they could hear their neighbors all up and down the line, you know. Mm -hmm. And this was Lon Van Tassel uh, lived just all about a half a mile, a little less north of him, and every once in a while he would holler at him and say, "Why don't you come over tonight and play cards?" And they'd be close enough that they could holler, mm -hmm. and he could holler to another neighbor if it was wind was just right and and make them understand him. You know, it was just that close. You know, yes. of course they followed in every quarter, and if they, they built on that, why well, mm -hmm. that put them pretty close together. Yes, and, but then of course they went to building fences and. Went and getting bigger acreages and so forth. I suppose the people that uh, stayed during the bowl or dust bowl 
bought up these places. Yes, a lot of them did. Uh huh. A lot and of them. For what? How much? Two or three dollars. Uh, yes, there was lots of the land at that time. You could just take it up for taxes. You know, they would. Uh, it wouldn't even cost you. He bought his tax title on it. Uh -huh. And uh, but there was a lot of land sold for two and three dollars an acre. Mm -hmm. It was a federal land bank. Uh, I know when well, my father bought some years later, but it wasn't. But uh, he bought a tax title on it. So. Mm -hmm. Of course, how it, much land do you own now? I own six hundred and forty acres. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some here at Laverne, and I have some out by Logan. Yeah. And uh, what is your family? Tell me about your family. I have uh, one daughter and two grandchildren. Uh, grand your daughter's name is? Sandra. Sandra Custer. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandson is Mervyn Custer. And my granddaughter is uh, Char Custer. And my son-in-law is Merle Custer. I noticed uh, your grandchildren is winning prizes in uh, the fairs. And tell me about them. Well, start with, you know, in this 4-H and FFA, the, the starting of all of it, your parents have to be in it mm -hmm. to make it go, you know. And yeah. Merle was real active when he was young in school. He was He liked FFA and 4-H and so forth, and so therefore he wanted uh, his kids to be, and so he went to working with them and uh, getting cattle for them and, and showing them how to clean them up and how to share them up, and they have, uh, you know, they haven't done anything real outstanding, but they have won their share of prizes and their share of winning, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, I, I enjoy going and watching them, and I, I'm very happy for them, And but it's very interesting. Um, weren't they chosen as the Outstanding Farm Family of the Year? Yes, I think um, that was three years ago. Three years ago. I believe it was. Mm -hmm. uh, they were That's quite chosen. an honor. Yes, that was nice. I'm glad they got that. I don't know just how they come about that, but I'm sure that um, they have a number of people that goes around and checks different ones. And what's your daughter doing today? She is postmistress at uh, what's the Logan, it's the Logan Post Office, but it has moved up with the Midway Church now, and she was appointed as postmistress there about, oh, three months ago, something like that. Uh, where is that from the original site? That is um, mile two mile from the original site mm -hmm, of Logan. All right, it's three north and two west of the original mm -hmm. site. Then the name of Logan is going to live on a long time. Yes, Logan will always be, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, even yet, when we talk of people, unless it's just youngsters, uh, you mentioned Logan, and you can usually get your directions there. Mm -hmm. Logan has... Uh, has been there for a long time. You know, some have come and gone. There is a lot of little spots over in just west of us there, but uh, it, you can't direct anybody from it because nobody ever knew it was there. But, mm -hmm. uh, Logan was there recent enough that everybody knows where Logan was. Okay, can you think of anything else? <clears throat> well, I, I'm sure I'll think of a lot of things after we quit talking. I could talk for a week about things around Logan. My, that's where I spent my entire life. Uh, I've told this before, it ain't very nice, I guess, but when Mort Mansfield lived there, Kenneth McClurg and I run around together a lot, and we had to have gas money. And uh, so the old style pumps had a little old stub handle out there about so far mm -hmm. and That's you could put a pipe job. wrench on that and work it back and forth and you could get gas out of it so now this you know i i guess i have to tell it all so anyhow we'd go by there and we would uh, pump that up we well we'd steal gas that's all there was to it you might mm -hmm. well admit it 
Anyhow, when I, uh, years later, I, I seen what I'd done wrong, and I knew it was wrong, so I had to find out someone to make that right, you know. So I, Mort had been gone for years, uh, and, and uh, I didn't know where Mort was at, but anyhow, I found out where Mort Mansfield, which used to run the store, where he was at. He was in California. So I wrote to him and told him that I here was it. I sent him a check and I felt like it. Uh, I'd stole gas, this much gas from him and I wanted to pay him for it. And I got a real nice letter back from Moore thanking me for it and everything. And I, of course, that all goes along with the Logan story, you know, and mm-hmm. things that happened there. Mm-hmm. And uh, but anyhow, that was a little old trick that I'll never forget because I I thought I was really having fun and getting by on with it, but mm-hmm. it. It got to eating on me later years, yeah. and I, it, and then I remember so many times on Saturday when we would go down over to one of the buildings there that played dominoes. Oh, that was a, everybody in the whole community would gather in there and play dominoes, and we'd play dominoes. We'd almost be late with our chores that night, and Dad and Mother and other well, Mother the women didn't play, but the men did, and Dad and I would stay there and. Almost dark to play dominoes. There was some home milk after dark, you know, just to play dominoes. But Logan was a, it was a lot of fun. It was a fun place. Yes. Well, it was the community center. Yes. The old schoolhouse, you know, we had literaries in it. We'd yeah. have on, have a, we'd go down there on, that was on, you'd have them on Friday nights. That'd be on so many night. people don't know what, I, what we mean by a literary. Can you tell us? Well, I don't know exactly why they called it literary, but all uh, what we would call it now would just be a program. Mm-hmm. That's what we'd probably call it now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't guess I can uh, explain just why they call them literaries, but anyhow, I know that uh, we would uh, have singing and we'd have music of all kinds. Anybody would just come in out of the country, there was no rehearsals, nowhere. We just... Everybody wanted to sing, bring their tablet with their song, wrote on a piece of tablet paper if they had it, and play their guitar and sing. And uh, we had a lot of fun. We had box suppers and pie suppers there. That was a big thing. We'd raise enough money there to uh, put us up a basketball goal, or we'd put, buy mats for the schoolhouse mm-hmm. from pie suppers and box suppers. And then that was not side that we would get to sit with her girlfriend and eat <laughs> what stuff she'd fixed us. We thought that was a big thing. We might not give it 35 cents for the box, but she'd have a big old batch of uh, sandwiches and pie and stuff like that mm-hmm. in there. And it was it was lots of fun. And then you got to sit next to your girl. Yes, that was probably the only time. <laughs> and she might not even better girlfriend, at least we called them that, you yes. know. Yes. But uh, it was... Uh, and what about church? We haven't mentioned church. Uh, was there a church in Ivanhoe, I mean in Logan? The only church that was there was the old Methodist church up on where, by Midway right now, which sat just west of Midway, west side of the road. Of oh, Midway. yes. And there was a Methodist church there. But we had, in my boyhood days, where I went to church was at the Victory Schoolhouse. There was a schoolhouse up there. And they always, they had church in the Victor Schoolhouse. And that's where I went to church until they built Midway. And then I went mm-hmm. to Midway to church. Mm-hmm. And I went You're to a member of the Midway Country Church? And, oh, I just, uh, that's where I went when I went. About, mm-hmm. i not a member of any church. I just, uh, I go to Laverne Apostolic Church now, but I went mm-hmm. to the, to the Midway Country Church at that time, and uh, we, uh, but before that we had ministers and pastors, and or didn't have pastors, we just had preachers to come in and hold meetings at Victor Schoolhouse. Mm-hmm. Any denomination? Well, it was called uh, undenominational Apostolic Faith Church, is what it was called. I see. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was my church-going places. Mm-hmm. Of course, I go to different churches as far as I, even today, I go to uh, all churches as far as that goes. Mm-hmm. If I'm out someplace, and here in town, I go to different churches here because I enjoy going to different churches. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anything else? 
Well, I, uh, I guess there's there's a lot that it just seems like the man lived long as I there ought to be a lot more than that to talk about, hadn't there? And I always said this about the obituary. I've always thought that was a very sad thing to read a man's obituary. He lived a lifetime and five minutes read his whole life history. <laughs> and I uh, always felt like there was more to it than that. I think so. I, uh, I think, um, I don't know, when I read an obituary, it makes me feel sad that, because we know there's more to it. Mm-hmm, than mm-hmm. what is mm-hmm. read in three minutes time. Yes, we know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, well, my my if you know my first wife uh, was talking about her a while before I met yeah. her. She was a school teacher. She taught later years after we got through milking all the cows and everything. Well, then she became a school teacher. Then she taught school for twelve years before yeah. she passed away. Yeah. And uh, of course. A lot of people knew her. At, uh, yeah. uh, she taught Elwood Street School, which she was figuring on coming in and starting in Laverne School. Well. Yes, that was a very sad time, mm, I know, right. for yeah, you. Yeah. But you have a lovely wife now. Yes. Her name is? Betty. Betty Howard. Betty Howard. Uh, yes, she has been real nice. She has, uh, our children have accepted her, and she's accepted them, and our, mm-hmm. she has two, she has a, a daughter and a son, and they seem like one of her brothers and sisters to my kids in the same way to them. And they, yes. We all get along real good that's, and have good fellowship. That's lovely. That's lovely. It sure it is. All right. If that's all, then I'm going to say thank you, Robert, for this. And uh, I just wish you lots more happy days with your family. All right. Thank you very much. This is September 26, 1984. Bernice Jackson interviewing Robert Howard of Laverne, Oklahoma, formerly of Fort uh, Logan, Oklahoma. Okay, Robert, tell me about your grandfather, who seemed to be the first <coughs> ones to come. Uh, my grandfather's name was Dave Howard. He uh, first came to Enid, Oklahoma. He ran the race, a ter- a race on the opening of the territory strip that they run the race on, and he uh, uh, homesteaded on a place down by Goldtree, Oklahoma, near Enid, and that's where that uh, my father was raised as a child for some years. I'm not sure just how long they lived there, but they Excuse lived Excuse me, do you remember your grandfather telling you any stories about the race, his coming? I remember my father telling about him, but okay. I do not remember my, but all, I do remember my father telling me that they started the race and it was a just a little small pony he was riding this. He was not pulling it. He was riding it. And that, uh, anyhow, they were uh, making kind of light of him because of the, such a little light pony. But he said that, anyhow, he told me the horse's name and, and told me a few things like that. And that's about all that I can really remember. It's been so long since I've sat down and talked to my father about that. Mm-hmm. But, anyhow, I do remember him saying that he t- described the pony to me and the size, and it was a small one. And uh, but he won the race. Did he get a good piece of land? Very good. He got a very good piece of land. Uh, I have been back and I have seen it several times since. And uh, some of the the folks uh, owned it up until just recently, and I ain't right sure that some of them still uh, don't own it. They named uh, the one that uh, the cousin that owned it last. His name was O. B. Howard, which my father named my youngest brother after him, Orville Howard. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were on the place when I went down and t- 
talked with him some. They were still on the place at that mm -hmm. time. Okay, and then he decided to come out to Beaver County. He came to Beaver County and settled on a claim down by, on the Kiowa Creek. It was approximately four and a half miles south of Midway Church, uh, known as the Herb Smith land. Herb Smith uh, purchased it. I think some of their family purchased this from my grandfather. And uh, then it's known now that it's, it's a state of Herb, which his daughter owns it, Freddie Jurgerson and her, in uh, Bougie, it used to be mm -hmm. Bougie Smith. They own the place now. But your father was raised over at Gold Tree. He spent um, the, a part of his life there. Uh -huh. They originally, I believe my father has told me, they originally came from Kansas. His people originated out of Kansas mm -hmm. at uh, early years. Of course, mm -hmm. he never did live in Kansas, but that was where his people, he hired at that time, originated out uh -huh. of Kansas. Mm -hmm. And then he, my father, then he filed uh, at uh, up just about a mile north of his father's homestead mm -hmm. there on this place where he, it's still known as the, the, my brother still owns the place there. We, when my mother and father passed away, why, uh, two of us boys still has the land there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and your mother was, what was her name? Her name was Hattie Howard. Mm -hmm. And my father's name was Christopher Washington Howard. That was mm -hmm. My mother's name, full name, was Hattie May Howard. She always signed it Hattie M. And my father always signed his as Chris W. Howard. Mm -hmm. He never did write the full name. He couldn't fi figure why anyone would pile such a big name on anybody, but <laughs> that's a quite a name to Christopher Washington Howard, right? So he always, always signed it C.W. or Chris W. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, how many children was in your family? There were seven children. There were five boys and two girls. Uh, Irvin, he was the oldest, and then Glenn, and then Fred, and then Mary, my sister, my oldest sister, she came along then. And then my other sister, I had two sisters, which was Marjorie. And then myself, which is Robert. And then my youngest brother, Orville. And they were, that was our entire family. That was family. your family. Our family all was, we didn't, we never lost a child, or my parents Raised all her family there without a loss of any, death of any kind until um, uh, Fred, he was killed in an accident in 48, I believe it was. I wouldn't be sure on that. That dates, I'm not good at dates, I don't remember. But uh, anyhow, we, he raised the entire family there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, let's see. You were going to tell me about the uh, Logan, the very original site of Logan. And do you remember where it, it got its name, Logan? I have heard two stories of this. I heard this one time that, that said that General Logan, there was a general by the name of Logan, that they named it after him. But they, I think it Miss Harlan told me that was a lady that uh, was old timer. She would probably be uh, 120 years old if she was living today. Anyhow, she told me that there was a family or a, there that was named Logan that this town of Logan was named after. Mm -hmm. It was named after a man that lived there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I know there is a grave in the old Kiowa Cemetery that we made the stones for and put a name. His name is Logan. Now, whether he is the man or not, we do not know. But there is one stone down there, that homemade stone, because I helped make it, and it's got the man's name of Logan on it.